We're going to talk about sanctification some more today. Okay, we're going to just start in Zechariah 3. And um, before we get going, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, we come to you today and we thank you for the privilege of having your word, having your Son as our Savior. Lord, we pray that you build us up in your word, edify us, strengthen us, draw us into a closer and more uh, nourishing understanding of the things you've done and into a relationship with you that grows stronger each day. Reveal your love to us. We know your mercy and your kindness, but make it grow ever more abundant in our minds, Lord. Do all this through your word for your Son's sake. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Alright. In Zechariah chapter 3, we just want to read this real quick. It says, He showed me Joshua the high priest. Now this is the priest that was, uh, he was the high priest of Israel. Whenever uh, Israel had returned from Babylonian captivity. And they're in the land and Joshua's the high priest. And it says, He showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Now, I don't know if this is where the idea of the devil on one shoulder and, you know, angel, and I don't have no idea. But what we've got here is we've got a picture of the high priest and there's the angel of the Lord to support him, but who's right there to accuse him and confuse him? Right. Satan. Right. Now, do y'all think it's any different for us today? No. It's the same process. Now, verse 2. The Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuked thee. Now, did he make a bunch of accusations and, and calling names and threatening and all that? No. Nope. He just said, The Lord rebuked thee. In other words, the Lord is going to correct you. The Lord chastised you. Oh, Satan. Now, before we go any further, what does that tell you? In our walk with the Lord after salvation... What does it tell you? We're faced with, we're faced with, you're, we're faced with all this stuff, aren't we? Yeah. But who is going to have to win that victory? The Lord. The Lord. So the Lord is our strength, isn't He? Now He says, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. Now think about that for a minute. The Lord rebuked you because He's chosen Jerusalem. In other words, you're, you're now opposing God's chosen people, aren't you? And what's God going to do for His chosen people? Okay. He's going to protect them. Now, does that mean that they'll never be irritated by the devil? No. Nope. Does it mean they'll never fail? No. Ne you're going to fail all the time. But will you ever fall completely and be gone? No. Hey, when we get done with sanctification, we're probably going to go into looking at Israel. But remember what Paul said about Israel in Romans 11? Have they stumbled that they should fall and just be gone? In other words, are they gone? God now, forbid. It, God forbid. In other words, what he said was in reply to what he had taught in chapter 8. In chapter 8, he basically said, God chose something and God's going to do what he's going to do. And what, who can withstand God? Well, the natural inclination, somebody would say, oh, wait a minute, what about Israel? God chose Israel and now they're gone. Is Israel gone forever? No, no. no folks, Israel's got a future. And people don't like this, but the Jews have a strong future in the church. It's coming, it's very clear. But he says here, the Lord rebuked thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee, is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? In other words, if I reach down and snatch them out of Babylon, you think I'm going to leave them hanging? If I reach down and deliver them out of Egypt, you think I'm done with them? Now, you look at Israel's history, and many times in Israel's history, it looked like the Lord was done with them, didn't it? This is him look, looking at Israel, though. Uh -huh. In the case of us, he's looking at us. Yeah, it is. An individual. Hey, how y'all doing? Good here. Good to see y'all. Okay. We, we waited on you as long as we could. Are you doing this thing? Okay, we're in Zechariah 3. Now, if you look at Israel's history, weren't there times when you would have said, God's done with them? I mean, he's done with them. I can remember times when I literally thought my granny was done with me. That's it. I've crossed the line. I've gone too far. It's over. Was it? No. There was one time, I, seriously, I remember about a month went by because of something I had done. And I would not admit I did it. And you know, for about a month, I had no fellowship with her. 
And it was just, it was horrible, right? I wanted fellowship. Well, what happened as soon as I acknowledged what I did and called on her to forgive me? It, so then that's the same thing. Now, do you think God is going to treat the Jews in a different manner than He treats the Gentile believer? No. Do you think that God is going to call the church out and abandon the church? Has there been times in the history of the church that it looked like, as Elijah said, I'm only one left? I bet, and I bet y'all in the in the 1400s, I bet Martin Luther looked around and thought, I'm the only one that sees this, right? How about the, the little groups down through the years? And don't ever get the idea that Martin Luther restored the church. He most certainly did not. He was someone God rose up within the Catholic Church to, to do a thing. There was always believers. How about the Montanists and the, y'all know all them groups, you read about them, hiding out in caves all throughout Europe. I bet you they thought we're the only ones left, didn't they? We don't know how many generations they were, do we? You got no idea, but the one thing we can rest assured, has God always had His church? Yes. Have there always been believers? Mm -hmm. Has the church ever gone out of the world and needed to be restored into its existence? No. Now, does a child always have sweet fellowship with their parents? No. What in a in a proper relationship now? What causes the relationship to suffer? The the child, the actions, the obedience or disobedience of the child, doesn't it? Now, what do y'all think the situation is with me and you? It's the same thing. There are times when me and you feel, I know I'm not the only one in here, that sometimes you can feel that you could not be any further from God. You ever feel that way? Sure. And yet in that thought, in the back of that, something retrieves me out of it very quickly. I will never forsake thee. I will never leave thee. You're in my hand. No one can pluck you out. So then what brings me back into right thinking? Turn back to the Lord. Is it me turning back or is my no. assurance in Him? Sure. I look on the Lord and you know what I can say? He died on that cross for my sins. If God allowed His Son to die for my sins, God certainly is not wanting to just forsake me. And that what we can be assured of, right? Now it says again in verse 3, The Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. Is this not a brand plucked out of the fire? Yeah. In Zechariah 3, now verse 3. It says, Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Is Joshua already the chosen of the Lord? Yeah. That these filthy garments must indicate something not that he's not the high priest. Is it that Joshua is not God's anointed? No, he already said he chose him. Then how did his garments get dirty? It's his, his own life. The world, his sin, himself, he's got his garments dirty. But watch what he says. He answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and will clothe thee with a change of raiment. Now, we've talked many times about this because there's three different ways in which this happens. And I don't care what phrase you use about salvation, you'll find out this is the case. Right, if I just put a timeline for us to kind of work off of, I put it up here like this. I've got an individual here that God saves, okay? Here's the individual in his flesh, right? Now, God saves this individual. How does God save that person at first? Is it physical? Does He deliver us right out of this world? Spiritual. spiritual. So then all of a sudden, this person has spiritual salvation. I could also say this person has spiritual birth. I could say this person has been spiritually regenerated. I could say this person has been spiritually delivered, spiritually redeemed, spiritually adopted. I could say all kinds of things like that, couldn't I? But will there be another time when this person is going to have a form of salvation? Yes. Okay. When, when will that take place? Second coming. At the second coming or, or when this one goes back to the dirt? Millennial. And, it's a, okay, so then there's coming a point where we're all going to be regenerated physically, right? So it's going to be raised and changed physically. Okay? That's it. And Paul calls that redemption, doesn't he? And Paul calls that salvation, doesn't he? So I'll write over here physical salvation. 
Now, in between the seed back here and the harvest over here, what do you have? Church age. You got, well, you've got the church age, but in the individual. In, in the individual. Growth. Growth. You've got growth yeah. between the seed and the harvest. That's right. You've got growth. Sanctification. You've got it. So then there is an ongoing salvation. And I'm just going to call it, look, I'm going to, for lack of a better term, I'm going to call it mental. Okay? Because it's a salvation that's a process. And what's happening is, this thing is growing inside. It's this seed that was planted starts to grow and starts to take form inside there. And ultimately what's going to happen? The new man comes out. Now this is how God's doing it. And how do you very first enter into this process? Being born again. You're born again. Now how does a person, if you're sitting here and you've tried every form of doing, you know, you flipped over a new leaf, you've tried everything you can, to satisfy God's demands, and yet in the back of your mind, what do you always know? You failed, haven't you? You have fallen short. Y'all know there won't. There is not a single person in the world. The Bible says, "No man can come unto Christ." Jesus Himself said this, unless the Father draw him. So someone says, well, that's not fair. He didn't draw everybody. But there's no verse that says that. In fact, Romans chapter 1 says, God has given a certain light to all creatures, hasn't He? What's the first light that God's given us in nature? You can see there's a God, can't you? Yeah. Hey, the Indians talked about the great spirit, didn't they? What made them believe in a great spirit? Creation around them, right? But the second thing is something that God gives. It's inside of every man, and it looks to be a result of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In that act of disobedience, God in His graciousness, conscience. conscience. That you always basically know basic right from wrong? Yeah. Do you know by nature it's wrong to kill somebody? Yeah. Do you know by nature it's wrong to steal? Do you know by nature it's wrong to tell a lie? But have we ever told one? If I know by nature that it's wrong and yet I do it, what am I doing? I'm guilty. How in the world could I ever stand before the Lord and say I didn't know? Every human being knows, don't they? Does God give every human being that? If I refuse that first little bit of light, what would expect me to get any more light? I mean, think about it. If I won't acknowledge that I've got an issue, am I ever going to go looking for... No. See, that first little bit of light, it's given to all men. That's why we can say Jesus Christ lighteth every man, didn't He? Does that mean that God, uh, in His uh, providence, does that mean that God reached out and took certain people out there and blinded them from birth? No. No. Does it mean that there are some people who by their refusal to acknowledge that very little bitty first spark of interest are blind to their condition? Y'all think about it. If you, if, if I, okay, I wake up in the morning and my left arm's numb, right? What did I better do? I better get down to Providence, right? What, if my left arm's numb, chances are I'm on the verge of a heart attack, right? But I ignore those symptoms. I ignore those warnings, don't I? And so what happens? I'm going to probably have a heart attack and die. Would I be able to say this isn't fair? I didn't know. Didn't I know? What do all human beings, by nature, Romans chapter 1 says, by nature we know something and we ignore it. Do we know the difference between darkness and light? Yep. And what does a human prefer? Then how could anybody, I don't care, people say today, that's not fair, he never heard the gospel. You know, it's hard to say whether they prefer light or dark. Yeah, sometimes it is. Yeah, it is. is. Let them get up in, in the middle of the night and walk through a room dark. They won't do it. Not Don't turn true. the light on. Or you have a cell phone. <laughs> so then, let's, let's talk about this person. Is there any way that that person could actually stand and say, this isn't fair, Lord, you never had the gospel preached to me. No. no, you never heard the gospel. How does the gospel begin? People say it's Christ died from our sins, buried and raised for justification. Folks, that's, that's, come on. The gospel is the good news about Jesus Christ. Why did He come into the world? To save us. 
saved. To save sinners. Mm -hmm. Then what am I going to have to know about myself? I'm a sinner. sinner. If I don't acknowledge my sins and I say the things I do are not sin, then there ain't any more light coming, is there? All right, now, in the case of Zechariah, Zechariah had already been made the high priest, but he's become dirty. Now watch what it says. He's going to clothe him and give him a change of raiment. Okay, the moment that I believe, as an individual over here, I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world without sin and became sin for me. If I believe that, and I believe in God the Father who sent Him, and I believe there's my sacrifice, and I believe God raised Him from the dead after He paid for my sin, what does the Bible say God's given me? Eternal life. Eternal life. I have been clothed, spiritually speaking, in righteousness, right? right. Yep. But is my flesh righteous? No. Are all my thoughts righteous? No. Are my actions and my will righteous? No. So in other words, I've just been declared righteous by God. God now sees me righteous, doesn't He? Okay, a little baby's born and born into the world. The dad looks over there at that little son who's two hours old. And what does the dad see? There's my boy. My boy. Hey, there's the family name. There's my heir. He's going to carry on. He sees all these things, doesn't he? What's the child know? Nothing. All the child knows is, what, why, why am I in this place? What, I don't understand. I was in the darkness and now there's all this light, right? Ain't that kind of how it happens? So then what does that child need to do? Is that child physically prepared to take over the dad's administration? No. Is he mentally prepared? No. But is he genetically prepared? Yes. Do y'all see how it works? Yes. What do we become whenever we're born again here? You become a child of God. But what did Paul say? What kind of child are you? What stage in development? A babe. A babe in Christ. And what does a babe need? Milk. 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 And later on bread and then meat, right? So then is that child, could you call that child... A son prepared to run the dad's uh, affairs. No. But is he a son that's going to run the dad's affairs? Yeah. Then what's keeping him from running them right then? No. 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 He ain't grown. He don't have the skills, does he? So what does God begin to do with this child of his? He gives us the power to become sons, doesn't he? And, you know, we miss a lot of this because um, we just were, we're unaware of the customs back then. He, George had showed me something one time and I went and got to researching it and looking into it and it's really fascinating. You know, everybody knows what a bar mitzvah is, right? Yeah. Now what, what basically what's a bar mitzvah? Where it becomes a man. Becoming a man. Becoming a man. It's a coming of age, right? Yeah. In other cultures they have a coming out party. Even the girls have something called a bach mitzvah or mm -hmm. something like that, okay? Bach. In other words, it's a coming of age. Do you know what that Jewish parent is really saying? That man is saying about that boy when he's... Out of here. No? <laughs> he's saying just the opposite. That's American. We think I'm almost done paying for the groceries, right? <laughs> well, that's American. Do you know what that Jewish man's really saying? I now claim this child as an adult. This child is the offspring of my loins. This is the heir of... Hey, this is now officially my son... Revealing to the world. Ain't that what it basically means? The Romans did the same thing. The Roman would have a child and the man, it's his child. He can't deny the, the natural birth. It's his child, right? But when he came to a certain age, you know what the Romans would do? They would have an adoption. The man would officially adopt the child. In other words, as I have found this child to have reached a point where I'm willing to accept him as my heir. I'm going to accept him as the, he's going to be the, the heir apparent as we say it. In other words, it's a formal declaration that that son has been brought to a certain point in maturity, isn't it? Well, what did Jesus Christ say? He said that as many as believed on him had received the power to what? To become sons of God. As many as have been as many seeds as have been planted have give, been given the power to grow, haven't they? And if they grow, eventually what's going to happen? They can bear fruit, can't they? So then look at the process. The planting of the seed is their life in that seed. But what does that seed need? Food. Food, nutrients, rain, and sunshine. Ain't that what it needs? Is the rain 
the seed? No. no. Is there life in the rain? Oh yeah. No, not in. Not in the rain. The no. life's in the seed, isn't it? Exactly. But does the seed need the effect of the rain to bring the life yes. out of it? Amen. Now there's your word of God. There is life in the Word of God, but there's life in the Word of God the same way that the rain has life-given power to the seed. If you don't have the seed, is there life in that Word? No. Natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. He can't understand them, can he? No. Now, as this person begins to grow, he starts to experience certain things in, in, in spiritual life. He begins to experience things, doesn't he? Sometimes the experiences are profound. There might be a moment when you're studying and something comes clear in the Scripture and you have one of them aha moments where something becomes clear, right? There might just be a day you're driving down the road and you hear something and it hits you like a ton of bricks. You might just be meditating. At one time I was cutting the grass and something come to me while I was cutting the grass that completely opened my eyes to some other stuff. All I was doing was cutting the grass and the Lord had my thinking go, right? So then... Was that event something that I could call sanctification? Or was that event when I was cutting the grass an experience during sanctification? The experience is not the sanctification. The rain is not the seed. The rain is an aid to the seed, isn't it? The sunshine is an aid to the seed. But where does the life and the growth come from? From the seed. Now, who is, in our analogy, what's the seed? It's the Lord Jesus Christ in you. It's Christ planted in you. It's new life, isn't it? It's the divine nature. Now, I plant a tomato. What does that tomato seed have in it? It's got the tomato seed. It's got the life and the nature of the tomato, doesn't it? What's in the divine seed? The moment you're saved, what's in there? The nature of God. But is it fully developed? No. So then what does Paul say God does with us from salvation first here spiritually? And look, you're as saved that day as you're ever going to be. But you aren't mature. You aren't prepared. You sure aren't in a position to rule and reign over anything. You can't even rule and reign over your own body, can you? So then what begins to happen? God, who has brought forth a child, begins to raise that child. Now, just because you are a child of God, does that mean that you're always going to have sweet fellowship with your Father? No what causes the break in that fellowship? Our own disobedience, our own lack of obedience. So what happens here in the case is we've got a man who was clothed, he's dirty, he's washed, he's clothed again. Look at verse 5. I said, let them set a fair mitre upon his head. A mitre is the, the, the head of a priest. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. Now watch this. The angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, what does protest mean? Hmm? Hey, well, it's like this. Like when people have a protest today, they something. Huh? Kind of against something. Yeah. Exactly. In other words, to protest is to stand before and testify of against or about something, right? Watch what he says to him. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house. You know what you could say? He, I remember my granny would leave, and she would put my sister Jill in charge. Susan was already gone. There was Susan was the oldest, then Jill, then Gina, then me. And she would put Jill in charge, and it would make me so mad. Now, she was older than me, but you know, I was a boy. I thought, I'm the man of the house. You know how you get that, the old man tells you that, right? But my granny would put Jill in charge, and it would make me so mad. Now, why would she pick Jill? She was, more mature. she was more mature. If she'd have put me in charge, that'd have been a disaster, wouldn't it? But he says, if you will walk in my ways. You know what I found out later on? Something amazing happened. I got to be about Jill's age, and I had another cousin, and my somebody went somewhere, and my granny talked to my younger cousin and was telling them some stuff. And I'm standing there and said, wait, hold on a minute. What's going on here? What, what are you doing, right? And I never forget what my granny told me. She said, I can't trust you to obey me. No, I couldn't trust you any further than I could throw you, she used to say all the time. So even though I had the age 
the length of uh, time in service, we'll say. Nothing. Did that make me as much? No. So then what made my granny decide who was going to be in charge of the house when she was gone? The one who walked in her ways. The one who walked in her ways. Do y'all see what the Lord's doing with us? Absolutely. Folks, Jesus Christ said, if I can't trust you with my goods in this life, what makes you think I'd trust you with them in the next life? Does that mean you're not a son? No. <laughs> Does it mean that my granny turned me out and I was no longer a member of the family? Does it mean she didn't love me? No, it meant she knew exactly what I was better than I knew, and she knew what was right and what was wrong, didn't she? Now, me and you believe that we know how we ought to be used of the Lord, don't we? And me and you don't know nothing. Y'all think about me and you. If it was up to me, there ain't no telling what I... I mean, I'd, I know it'd be a failure, number one. But don't we always look at the things the Lord uses other people in, and we always think, well, I, I would be good at that, or I would be used here. He ought to use me for that. Does the Lord know what He's doing? Okay. The process of the Lord doing all of this, we've been talking about it, it's called sanctification. Now what does sanctification mean? It means God choosing a thing, not because there's anything special in that thing. It has nothing to do with the thing. It's God choosing the thing that makes it special, isn't it? So before God chooses it, is it special? It's just like the other things. But God chooses a thing and sets it aside from the other things and begins to cleanse it and do something with it, preparing it for His own purpose. The best example in the Scripture is the first time it's used. The very first thing God ever sanctified was the Sabbath day. Now, is the seventh day of the week different than the other days? It is now, but what's actually different about it? Seventh day. The only thing different about it is God chose it. Ain't that what made the Hebrew seventh day different than the other days? God chose it. Now they did things on that day that acknowledged that the day was different, but the only thing that made the day different was God chose it. Was there twenty four hours in that day like the other days? Was that could it rain and, and light? No, yeah. So the day was no different. So then we come over here to human beings and we can't accept that. Human beings won't accept what's true all through the Old Testament. What made God pick Jerusalem? <coughs> Is it the most beautiful place on earth? What made God choose Israel? Were they the greatest nation? He said they were the least. Yeah. What made God choose Moses? Was Moses the mightiest man on earth? The Bible said he was the meekest. Did he speak right? Somebody said, well, then he chose him because he was meek. No, God made him meek because he had chosen him. How, did, how was Moses chosen? When he was 40? God's choice. How, come on, now, when did the story start with Moses? At birth. At birth, folks. God put him, took care of him from birth, didn't he? How about uh, Jeremiah? Jeremiah said, the Lord appeared to him and said, I have chosen you from your mother's womb. How about Paul? Said the same thing. Did Paul, was he educated? Yes. Yeah. Then was God already preparing him for his use? Yeah. Now Paul used that education for his own glorification, didn't he? Was Paul a man with a zealous uh, attitude? Yeah. yeah. He was very zealous against Jesus Christ, wasn't he? Was Paul a man that was obviously a good teacher? Yeah. Did God give him all those skills and training? Yes. Why? To use him for his purpose. He knew he was going to use him, didn't he? Right. But before God called and, and revealed these things to Paul, how did Paul use all those skills? He used them all for his own glorification. But when the Lord got ready to use Paul, all the Lord did was put a new motivation in him and turned him right around, and all them skills now became useful for the Lord, didn't they? So can you say that Paul's training began the day he was saved on the road to Damascus or had it been going on all his life? Folks, God does these things. Now, in the sanctification, the very moment God sets the person apart spiritually, that's called sanctification, isn't it? Is there a physical setting apart over here? Yeah, you'll be set apart physically. But in between is the process. Somebody give me another word for this. How about growth? School. Schooling, Learning. training, growing, Learning. washing, purging, cleansing. There's all kind of words in the Scripture for it, isn't there? Alright, now, what we're going to do today, I'm going to kill a lot of time doing that, but we're going to look today at basically 
the three uh, main under, main ideas about sanctification. Okay, the first one is perfectionism. Now, what is when I say perfectionism? What's that mean? It's the idea that all of a sudden there is a moment when you are perfect and sin is no longer the issue. Right? Now, do I believe that, spiritually speaking, I have been made spiritually perfect and my sin's penalty is not the issue? Yes, I believe that with all my heart. But can I take that too far? Yes. I, I was part of a system that taught me that your sins all were destroyed at the cross and God ain't interested in sin. It don't make one bit of difference what you do. And yet, if you read the New Testament, you find about half of it's telling me, do this and don't do this, and how, right? How to walk. So then, can I take this perfectionism and go too far and just turn it into lawlessness? Sure. But I also can take it, look, this, this basically got its recent history. It's always been around. But it got its recent resurgence because of John Wesley. John Wesley said that there came a point in time when God would perfect a person and basically as long as they, they, they wouldn't still sin willfully again and they were perfect. And out of that rose the holiness movement, right? Hey, do y'all know much about John Wesley's history? John Wesley preached for years and years and years and had no security. He had no, he, I mean, the man had no peace, no anything. And all of a sudden, one day, God showed him essentially that, you know, that Christ had taken care of all his sins. But he had a moment when it became so clear to him that he began to believe that every human being was to have this second moment. And from that moment forward, they would be perfect. Now, that teaches that sanctification is, is an event. One event. It teaches that sanctification is not a process. And it teaches that sanctification is something to which a person needs to just aspire unto that moment. Not don't do this and don't do that. Not do these things. Not any of that. It's just strive for this one moment. And in the holiness movement it became known as the second work of grace. Y'all all heard of that? They say the first works when you say. Now you need to pray through for the second work. Now, y'all have all seen this. Maybe they don't say it, but haven't y'all all heard about these meetings where they all sit around and grab somebody and shake them and they pray and pray? Y'all heard the term pray through? That's what all that's about. They're trying to get that second experience. And yet the Bible says no such thing. Okay, so perfectionism is the first one. The second one is counteraction. Counteraction says yes. After the person saved, sin still is present, but God puts a second thing in there, and that second thing is stronger than the first, and if you'll just rely on the second thing, it'll wipe out the first. That makes sense? That's counteraction. And then the third one is that it's an actual ongoing process that starts over here and won't end until you're with the Lord. Now, those are basically the three views. Now, why do we even want to talk about this? Well, a person trusts Jesus Christ as their Savior. What was your first thought after that? Hallelujah. Yeah, hallelujah. You get the peace of God, but then you, you settle down, and then what do you begin to think? Well, what about well, this sin? I ain't, yeah. really made, I ain't really perfect. Now, yeah, something's still wrong, ain't it? What about this sin? I've still got sin in my life. What is God going to do about these sins? And so then what happens? These different ideas rise up. One says your sins don't matter. I, you know, okay, I once heard a preacher say something that helped me a lot. And the man preached the gospel very well. I'm thankful for the way he preached the gospel. But he said to a, a body of people gathered together, all supposed to be saved, he said, I don't have to love you. He said, I don't even like some of y'all. All I got to do is preach the gospel. And that hit me like a ton of bricks because I thought, wait a minute. How many times did Paul tell us about, you know, we need to... And I thought, something's wrong with that statement. And it got me to start looking at something. I'm thankful for it. But what that man believed was that once you have salvation, that's all there is, is salvation, right? So then once you have that particular experience, they say you are perfected forever in God's eyes. Well, that's true spiritually speaking. But is it true every other way? No. Okay, so now the, the reason we cover these things, again, is because, hey, you know, what about these sins? Now... All right, we talked about John Wesley. We did that. <clears throat> Tell you what, I just want to show you uh, a couple scriptures. For instance, 
each view has scriptures that they that they stand on. And 1 John, if y'all flip over to 1 John chapter 3, I'll show you where perfectionists take their stand. Alright, 1 John 3, verse, uh, verse 9. Now this is where those that believe in perfectionism get their, basically get their doctrine from. 1 John 3, 9. John, now is John writing to save people? Sure. Yeah, he says he is in chapter 5. He said, that I'm writing this that you can know that you've got salvation. In verse 9 he says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now you think about that for a minute. I can see where John Wesley got the idea that, hey, I, I don't commit sin anymore, can't you? But what it's really saying is, if we keep it in the context, look. Whosoever is born of God. Now, can you claim in your flesh to be born of God? Your flesh is born of Adam, isn't it? Then what is this thing, or who is this thing that's born of God? It's the new creature. It's the new man. Look, it's that little blue seed right there. Now, that little blue seed is not in you by birth, naturally, is it? It comes in you by spiritual birth. When does it come? When, when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed to you as Savior. When you're regenerated, here comes this seed, right? Now, he said that seed remaineth in him. What nature does this seed have? Let's draw the old man here first. This flesh has got whose nature? Adam. Adam's nature. You know what? I didn't mean to use that green... If I'm watching, Randall's going to rebuke me. They can't see that green hood. The old man has got Adam's nature. Do we all agree with that? Mm -hmm. Are you born with it? Yep. And over time, what do you prove? In your flesh, as you grow, what do you prove? You're a you prove you got Adam's nature, don't you? Yeah. Do you have every bit of Adam's understanding and experience at birth? Nope. But is everything that's in Adam by nature in you? Yeah. Yeah. Then are you going to be like Adam? Yeah. You're going to be like Adam because Adam's seed remaineth in you and it's going to bring forth after its own kind, isn't it? But when Christ is put to you, when the Holy Spirit takes up residence in you, what nature is this seed after? It's Christ's nature. Peter says it's a divine nature. Now, when John is writing, is John writing to people that have both natures? Yep. He says to this group of people, if we say we have no sin, we're liars. Yes. Then he says, we do not commit sin. Now, y'all see the difference? He said, the new creature doesn't sin because the new creature can't sin because it's made in the image and likeness of the one that brought it forth. But where's all this happening at? It's happening in this pile of dirt. Folks, this is it, isn't it? Now, I'm born in Adam's nature physically. I've got Adam's spirit. I've got Adam's mind. But what begins to happen to my mind from birth? It begins to grow. It begins to grow and to change and to experience. That's called our soul. From the moment you take your first breath till you die, your soul is what you've made of. In other words, it's all your experiences and all, isn't it? Now, what are most of our experiences based on, linked to, and all about? The flesh, the self, and this world, isn't yeah. it? All the words that come in. What's stored on our brain? Is it mostly the Word of God stored in your mind? No. What about your experiences? Are they mostly godly experiences? Mm -hmm. What are they? Fleshly. They're fleshly. Then you and I have been, have been formed. Our thinking, by the time we become something you could call a son... Our thinking has been conformed to this world, hasn't it? Does everybody agree with that? And our flesh follows, doesn't it? But what did Paul tell us to do after salvation? 
be not conformed to this world. To this world. Be transformed. In other words, you've got this spiritual soul, so to speak, this spiritual man, and what are you supposed to be doing? Renewing your mind. Renewing your mind and feeding it. So then what are you making of your spiritual man? You're making the same thing you made of your fleshly man. In other words, they're all in one vessel and the process of sanctification is the bringing in of new and flushing out of the old. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so this is the verse they use mainly for that. Now, for perfectionism, well, I tell you what, let me give you one more. Go to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 26. All right, in Hebrews 10, 26, <clears throat> it says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Now, what the perfectionist says about this, and look, I'm not telling y'all what, what, I'm just going to show you the, you, you make your own choices, but I'm going to show you where these come from and, and you decide. The perfectionist says what that verse means is, if we sin willfully, then that's sin and that's a problem. Now, John Wesley said to sin unknowingly isn't sin. Now, think about that. <clears throat> What's the Bible say? The Bible says foolish thinking is sin. You had any foolish thoughts this morning? Most of our thoughts are foolish, aren't they? So now, what is this verse really talking about? If we keep it in the context, it's actually pretty simple, isn't it? The book of Hebrews is explaining the customs of the law and how they're all fulfilled in Christ, aren't they? What were the Hebrews in general still wanting to do? Keep the law, keep the law and offer sacrifices. Right. By insisting that they got to offer that sacrifice, what were they insisting was still the issue? Sin. The sin. penalty of sin. Yeah. Then what were they willfully making the problem? Okay. Sin's penalty. Mm -hmm. And what did he say? There ain't another sacrifice. If you think sin's penalty is the problem, you ain't got another sacrifice. Where are you going to find it? There ain't any more. You're in trouble, right? So he talks about our conscience being set free. So that's kind of one of the ideas. Now, these people that believe in perfectionism, they say sanctification can be received in a moment and it's an experience. Right? That's where the whole term, the second uh, work of grace comes from. If y'all know any holiness people, they, they talk a lot about the second work of grace, don't they? In other words, they say, you got saved, but now you got to uh, get the other, get the, get the second. Okay? Um, that's the second work of grace. Now, if this view is correct, then someone that's sanctified certainly needs no rebuke. Do we all agree with that? If sanctification is something that you attain unto, it's an event, then under perfectionism, once it is required, is that person done with sin? According to perfectionists, they are, right? Then would there be any need to rebuke them? Would there be any open rebellion in that person? Y'all go to 1 Corinthians 1. Alright, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. And by the way, that does not mean to be. Some people actually say that this means in at some point in the future to be. Because in verse 2 they read it. Unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. They say these people were going to be saints one day. Folks, that's not what it means. It means God chose Paul to be an apostle and he called him and what's he going to be? An apostle. You know how Paul said he was made an apostle? By the effectual word. Huh? What's that mean? It means God performed the work and it's effectual. Okay? It's kind of like, a, um, have y'all, anybody ever, I've never planted peanuts, but I, I know folks that have fooled with peanuts. And you know what a peanut farmer will tell you? If you plant a peanut, y'all know what? It's coming up. Yeah. It is coming up. I've seen it in action. On, when y'all go back out March Road that way, every few years that fellow on the right, they got it for sale now, but every few years he'd set a cot and he'll plant peanuts. I went by there and I watched them as they were planting them and I always wonder what's he planting this year and I saw the peanuts start to come up. 
You know what started to happen out there? He had an old pump house lid. I know it ain't there anymore, but it was just the, the roof off the pump house out there, and it was sitting on the ground, right? But at first, the roof of the pump house was leaning against it. They planted the field and all. Well, I looked, went by, I don't know if the wind got it or what, but the lid off the pump house blew over and was laying on the ground after he planted the peanuts. Do y'all know what I watched that lid do? At, over the next couple, yeah, over the next few weeks, I watched that lid lift up like that. All them peanuts under that lid came up. They're coming up. See, that's the effectual working of a peanut, isn't it? Does that make sense? Well, the effectual working is what made Paul an apostle. Does that y'all see what God did with him? Okay, now, here's the Corinthians. Verse 2 says, Unto the church of God which is at Corinth. Then would that apply to the church of God at Grand Bay? Yeah. At Theodore? Yeah. At Ephesus? At Jerusalem? At anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. To them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Are the Corinthians sanctified? Yeah. Yeah. Then according to the perfectionist view, what should they be done with? Sin. Done with sin, right? No rebuke, no correction. These people have received the second work of grace if this perfectionism is true. It says, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now what saved person doesn't fall under this instruction? None. By the way, what does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? Does it mean that you walked the aisle and sought salvation and God rewarded you? Everybody has all heard, you know, I was once in a room with a lady and me and her were reading scripture together and this young fella come in and right in the middle of me reading the Bible, he came in and stopped us. So I knew whatever he had in his mind was very important. He had a little laminated card in his hand. And he said, excuse me, ma'am, would you pray with me? And Miss Dorothy said, well, pray with you about what, honey? What do you need me to pray for you for? He said, no, not for me, for you. Well, you know how that's going to affect a person. Mm -hmm. She immediately got her back up. She said, pray for me. What are you talking about, you know? He said, would you say this prayer with me? And she looked at it. She couldn't see. Her eyes were bad. She said, I can't see that. What does it say? And he said, it says, and he read uh, Romans uh, 10, 10, 9 and 9 10. 10. Now confess my mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? He thought if he could just get her to repeat those words, what would it do? Save her. It'd save her. Now y'all see how people can make salvation very silly? What does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? Is it a formality? No. What's it mean? Believe. It's to believe. You've got to believe on Him to call on Him, don't you? Y'all yeah. ever read the book of Judges? Okay, you need to. Read it. You want to see sanctification? Read the book of Judges. Was Israel God's sanctified people? They got out there in the land and what did they do? They turned to idolatry. Willingly. It got so bad that they were under persecution and when things got to rock bottom, what did they do? They cried out to the Lord to save them, didn't they? And what did the Lord do? He saved them. You know what them same people did? 20 years later, they were back in the same position. They cried out to the Lord sincerely, and what did He do? Now, y'all see, calling on the Lord is calling for deliverance. Calling on the Lord is the drowning person hollering out that you need saving, right? But there's something else in it. To call on the name of the Lord. It isn't just to scream out, I need somebody help me. Some, that ain't it. Calling on the name of the Lord is screaming out specifically in your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know He's the Son of God. He's the only one. He's the only one. The heart you, is worth that. That's exactly right. You know that what He did on that cross was for you and you believe that. Now, if you do that, do you know what's already been happening? Is that the moment all of a sudden that God begins to work with you? No. The Bible says the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, doesn't He? Sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. Who in this world has ever lived that can't say they were not convicted of sin in their conscience, of righteousness, and of judgment to come? Folks, y'all know the most ungodly of people will say something like, well, I'm living, I'm going to go to hell. They, they know there's judge. They know there's sin. They know there's righteousness. They know they're not righteous. They've done wrong. And what do they know is, is right? There's judgment to come, isn't there? Yeah. Who's going to be able to stand before the Lord that refused Jesus Christ and say, I didn't know. 
You can't do it. So now, to call on the name of the Lord, this is written on all of them. So, are the Corinthians sanctified? It says so, doesn't it? Yep. Well, come down, if you would, to verse 11. It hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. This I say, every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Wait a minute, you mean to tell me the church at Corinth has got schisms and divisions? Then no. are they without sin? No. But we just read that they're sanctified, didn't we? Mm -hmm. If you, We just keep coming. Come down to chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 3. Well, let's read from verse 1. I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you are not able to bear it, neither yet are you now able. What would you call them? Babes. Babes. Immature Christians, right? Yep. He says, ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are you not yet carnal and walk as men? Then can a sanctified person walk in the flesh like a, like a, can he sin? Yep. Yeah. All right, go to uh, chapter 4. Put some old garments back on. Yeah, it's there, they're getting dirty on it. Yeah. All right. In chapter 4, verse 14. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. Though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be followers of me. For this cause I have sent Timothy unto you, who is my beloved. And he's coming down here, he's going to tell them to, to warn them, to teach them. Now watch what he says about them in verse 18. Now some of you are puffed up as though I would not come to you. Does this sound like mature Christians? Or does it sound like a very carnal church? Look in chapter 5, look at verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Imagine that, I mean, this is going on in Corinth. Hey, it's one thing you guys fooling around. This guy's sleeping with his father's wife. Do y'all see the issues here? Then is this a pure sanctified, perfected, second work of grace church. But aren't they called sanctified? And we could just keep going. Look, this church is fighting and misusing the spiritual gifts, aren't they? They're, they're jockeying for position. There's some in this church saying that there's not even such a thing as the resurrection, aren't they? Would you call this group perfect? But are they perfect yes. spiritually? Yes. But where are they not perfect yet? In their flesh and why? What controls your flesh? The mind. Your mind. So in other words, they're still carnal minded, yeah. aren't they? If you're carnal minded, what's going to happen? You'll walk carnally. When you think spiritually, what happens? You walk spiritually. Okay, so then sanctification definitely is not something like that. Look, surely Paul's statements in Romans 7 disprove this theory, doesn't it? Was, would you say Paul was sanctified? Yeah. Okay? Would you say Paul, after 25 years, understood what he was teaching? And in Romans 7, what did he say he had dwelling in him? Sin. Yeah. He didn't say it's okay, it's there, it's going to be there till you die, don't worry about it. That's, and that's lawlessness, that's antinomianism. Look, I used to believe that and I was taught that, and that's fine. When I was three, I thought the moon was made of cheese. Did that mean I wasn't a, a, a child? No. You see, it's our thinking's got to grow, doesn't it? Look, that form of lawlessness sounds real good at first. It really does when you're under the guilt of your sins. I found that doctrine and I latched onto that doctrine because that doctrine gave me peace of mind about my life. But if you truly are saved and if the life of Christ is in you, how's that doctrine going to go? It ain't going to work out too good. What happens? It gets worse and worse, folks. I wound up in a safe condition worse in my mind than I had ever been in my life. Y'all ever been like that? What happens? It's God changing your thinking, isn't it? Okay, so now we can do away with the perfectionism. All right, we better take a break, then we'll look at the other one, then we'll get to the last one.